Hey all, what is up? Kizby here, and today we're going to be looking at my updated Going Second Flanderies deck profile for the June 2023 format. So, a few things up top. If you are new to the channel and finding this because you want to pick up Flanderies, and honestly, I think it's a pretty great time for that. While I will explain more or less what everything does in this video, I won't be going as deep into the fine print and rulings on everything as I've done in the past, mostly for getting this video out in a timely manner and mostly for the audio editing part of my brain sanity. But if you're interested in more in-depth rulings and stuff like that, check out the Flanderies playlist on the channel for a ton of it. Next, I have done some new format testing with this deck and so far so good, but it was also performing very well late into the previous format and I think it's well positioned to continue doing so. All that being said, I may update it going forward depending on how things shape up in the next couple of months, but I think this is perfectly fine for now. And lastly, don't forget to drop this video a like and subscribe to the channel for even more. One more thing though, for the longtime subscribers, there's going to be a card choice in here that I've spoken against doing in the past, but hear me out, I have a good reason for it. So let's kick this off with triple copies of Fulanderies and Rabina. Really quick, we're going to highlight the level one Fulanderies shared effects. First, all of them after the resolution of their unique effect allow you to immediately normal summon another winged beast from your hand. Next, if they are banished face up on the normal summon of another winged beast, you can return them back to your hand. Both of these effects are hard once per turns and prevent you from special summoning during the turn you activate either effect and vice versa. Lastly, they all share a condition that if while face upon the field, they were to leave the field in any way bound for any destination, they will be banished face up instead. This condition supersedes things like being banished face down by evenly matched or a Kostura effect, or being bounced or spun back into the deck so long as the Flanderies monster in question is face up on the field at the time of resolution of said effect. And with all that out of the way, Rubina's unique effect is to add a level 4 lower winged beast from your deck to your hand. Absolutely a 3 of, she is our only pure 1 card engine. Next up, Flanderies and Eaglet. Another three of, in addition to the shared effects, he can search a level seven or higher winged beast and add it to our hand. Another one that I feel strongly about having at three, while he isn't necessarily a one card starter on his own, he is solid to start with and a great bird to open, especially in combination with the rest of the in archetype support that we are running. In grindier games, we can run out of search targets in the deck, but we have another card that helps to mitigate that, keeping his search effect alive. Next up, one each of Fulanderies and Stree and Fulanderies and Tukan. Stree can target a card in either graveyard and banish it, and Tukan can target a banished Fulanderies card and add it to your hand. So aside from the obvious uses, Stree sniping out problem cards from the graveyard and Tukan recovering anything that may have been banished, these two do form a small resource loop, allowing you to banish spent Fulanderies spells and traps, and Empen as well, then use Tukan to recover and reuse them. I think one of each is perfectly fine for these, as neither are particularly great for starting off plays, so we generally don't need them turn one, and with Mindhacker having been banned, the risk of losing them from being milled off the top of the deck to being banished face down is greatly reduced. That does it for all the small birds. Next up, the big birds. First off, we're on two copies of Fulanderies and Empen, the queen of non-once-per-turn effects. Empen's got a lot going on. First, if she was tribute summoned, as long as she is face up on the field, your opponent cannot activate the effects of special summon monsters that are in attack position. Next, when she battles, attacking or being attacked, during damage calculation, banish a card from your hand as cost, half the attack and defense of whatever she is currently battling. And lastly, on her summon, add a Fulanderies spell or trap from your deck to your hand, then after that resolves, normal summon any monster. So first, I know I said I wasn't going to go too deep into rulings, but this is important to be aware of. Mpen's Floodgate effect doesn't actually negate anything, rather it fully prevents the activation of effects. Let's compare this with Skill Drain. So under Skill Drain, something like Prank Kids Dildle Dildle Do can activate, trading itself for cost, therefore no longer being affected by Skill Drain. So it will resolve its effect. Something like Cherubini, whose cost is actually more important than the actual effect attached to it, can still send from the deck to the graveyard as cost under Skill Drain, just not being able to resolve the actual effect. 
Mpen doesn't allow this. You couldn't even pay the cost of the Affirmation monsters under Mpen, as that would entail actually activating them. On the flip side of this though, because Mpen only interacts with activation, anything with a continuous effect is more or less unaffected, so something like Masquerade Dragon would still hit you for damage every activation, as that effect doesn't actually activate. Next, Mpen's Battle Trick effect is deceptively hard to interact with. So just to do a quick refresher, damage step, before damage calculation, you can use effects that A, explicitly say that they can be used here, B, directly alter stat lines on monsters, C, negate the activation specifically of cards and effects, and D, trigger effects that don't say that they can't be used here. Push that one step further into during damage calculation, that list goes down to A, cards and effects that explicitly say they can be used here, such as M-Pen and, funny enough, War Rock Wendo, B, cards that negate the activation of a card or effect specifically, and C, trigger effects. M-Pen falls into that first category, so she is activating at a point where a lot of cards can no longer interact with her properly. She's just a remarkably strong card, where on to because despite how loopable she is, it is very possible to summon multiples in one turn, allowing for a lot of searching and resource gathering. Next in line of our big birds, we're on one copy of Miss Valley Apex Avion. Apex Avion has the effect that when a Carter effect is activated, you can bounce a Mist Valley card you control to the hand, so in this case just itself, and negate the effect and destroy that card. This is remarkably strong in this deck, as the whole point of this deck is to force a simplified game state in which that one negation is a really big deal. But you might notice, there's no once per turn on this card, so we're actually able to use the effect, bounce Apex Avion back to the hand, then re-summon it on the same turn, giving us an additional negation. Plus removal if Unexplored Winds is on the field, but more on that later on. I think one of these is perfectly fine, as by the nature of its effect, it is very easily loopable, and it gives itself a bit of protection as well, being able to bounce itself back to the hand. The amount of times I've negated my own cards to dodge around a Kashtar or Fenrir only to resummon Apex in the same chain, it's a lot, and it's a lot of fun. And closing out the big ol' birds, we're on one copy of Ryza the Mega Monarch. On Tribute Summon, Ryza targets, by the way this effect is mandatory, one card on field and one card in the graveyard and spins them back to the top of their respective decks in any order. Then, as an optional add-on, if you tributed a wind monster as part of summoning him, you can target an additional card on the field and bounce it back to the hand. So, a few things to talk about here. First, not once per turn at all. And Ryza can self-target, so you can very easily summon Ryza multiple times on an opponent's turn. Next, something that, and shame on me, I haven't actually ever mentioned in a video before, Ryza must have a target on both field and in the graveyard in order to resolve the first part of his effect properly. If there isn't a target in graveyard for him to spin back to a deck, the first portion of this effect will resolve with that effect. You can, however, still resolve the bounce to hand as that is a separate add-on to this effect. Also, Ryza doesn't have to successfully spin his targets to resolve, just to be able to target them in the first place. Next up, Ryza can be tribute summoned with only one tribute by using a previously tribute summoned monster, so generally this will just be Mpen, who is also a wind as it turns out. This is very relevant and will come up very often. Ryza is overall an outstanding card and definitely should not be overlooked. We're only on one of them, as again, due to the nature of his effect, he is remarkably loopable, but if you did really want to run two, I would consider swapping out the Apex Avion for the second one, but I personally prefer the one and one split over a double Ryza. That's it for all the birds, let's talk about our only monster hand trap in Triple Dimension Shifter. So, D Shifter has two objectively bad matchups, Kashtura and the Mirror Match, although it does shut off any hand traps that send to the graveyard as cost. Looking at you, Drone Lockbird. So, there is at least a little bit of value there. After that, though, D Shifter's utility ranges from forcing alternative lines of play, such as in the Sprite matchup, taking away something like Totally Awesome Access and Sprite Sprint lines, Taking away recovery and additional effects that would go off in the graveyard, such as against Labyrinth and Tenyi Sword Soul, lowering the ceiling heavily on boards or making said boards way more expensive to build, such as Branded or Pearly, or full-on stopping plays, such as against Mathmac, Tier Laments, and Super Heavy Samurai, especially since they don't have Cyberstein to fall back on now. 
Plus, added bonus, it streamlines the process of Tukan recovering our spells and M-Pen from the Banished Pile. Overall, it's just a very great card to include here at 3, and I will be sticking with it. Alright, that does it for the monsters, spell and trap time. So let's start this off with three copies of Flanderies and the Magnificent Map. Check out the Flanderies playlist for some of the more finer points on this card. So during our turn, we can reveal a level 1 Flanderies monster in our hand, banish a Flanderies card from the deck, and then after that resolves, immediately normal summon the revealed monster. So first, this doesn't have to be another level 1 Flanderies monster, but it does help kick off our plays. Just keep in mind, M-Pen and our spells and traps are also valid banishes. Next, this doesn't actually use our game mechanic normal summon, so we can continue if we have the resources or the need to after this initial set of summons is finished. Following that, when our opponent normal summons, we can activate map's second effect, and then after it resolves, immediately normal summon any Flanderies monster. This is not limited to the level 1 birds and can be absolutely devastating in combination with unexplored winds, acting as instant removal and searching, letting us just drop an M-Pen onto the field. Also, this effect works on either player's turn, but that's really only relevant in the mirror match. No part of this effect restricts you from special summoning as well, which is important to know if we need to make emergency extra deck plays. And while both effects on map are in fact hard ones per turns, the activation of map itself as a card is not. So if you have two of them and your first one is destroyed before you activate the effects, feel free to go off with that second copy. Next up, we're on a fourth copy of map in terraforming. I still hold strong to keeping this card on the deck, it gives me more map access without having to expend an advent of adventure search for it, as I would much rather use advent of adventure to protect our small birds, or overextend and loop mpens for really big opens. And speaking of which, three copies of Flanderies and the advent of adventure. At quick play spell speed, banish a winged beast from your hand or field for cost, add either a Flanderies monster or field spell from your deck to your hand. Just a remarkably strong card, and it really unlocks so much of this deck, and bonus, we also gain 500 life points off of it for time rules. This can also play around some floodgates in weird ways by removing your birds from the field before they actually resolve, so you can get really creative with this one. Plus, the wording on the card implies that maybe in the future we'll get another Flanderies field spell, since the wording is pretty future-proof to not lock you into just searching Magnificent Map, but we'll just have to wait and see. Seriously hoping on that, though. Following that up, we've got one copy of Wanderies and the Unexplored Winds. This is another one that I'm going to direct you to the playlist for the finer points of this card, as there is a lot to know about it. But the basics are going to be here. First, it has a continuous effect that alters the condition of tribute summoning in a way that, if you want to, instead of tributing monsters, you can instead send one monster you control and one card, any card by the way, that your opponent controls to the graveyard to perform said tribute summon. So, because this isn't a cost but is rather part of the effect, it actually has no conflict with Dimension Shifter. The summon, while not actually tributing any monsters, is still treated as a tribute summon as well. This effect does not activate, it just happens, making it remarkably strong as a removal option, and it can be done as many times per turn as you can tribute summon. My best on this card was 4 tribute summons enabled by it, I believe. Just worth noting, this also doesn't bypass protection from spells or effects that an opponent's card may have. Next, once per turn, you can reveal up to two winged beasts in your hand, stack them onto the bottom of the deck, and draw that many cards. So this is amazing at keeping Eaglin alive, letting you cycle primarily Ryza out for a new card, and then research him later on with Eaglin, keeping the entirety of his effect alive. The other thing of note is that if your opponent does want to ash this effect, they have to ash on activation before you reveal anything or even declare how many cards that you will be cycling out. This is another one that I feel is perfectly fine at 1, as unless you're incredibly lucky, it cannot start off our plays and is much better once we've established ourselves as a bit of extra cleanup. Though it can be incredible if it's paired with Dark Ruler no more. Moving on from there into our consistency suite, we've got three copies of Pot of Prosperity. Not a lot to say about this, just keep in mind the restriction on prosperity does conflict with unexplored wins. However, if wins is ashed and no actual cards are drawn, you can go ahead and fire off prosperity, no problem. 
I generally try to save my double Isaiah line in the extra deck for the last things that I will possibly banish off of a third copy of this, but honestly, we go into our extra deck so infrequently, this is basically free. And three copies of Pot of Duality, basically a fully free half Pot of Prosperity. Just remember the special summon restriction on this for those one in a million board states where you do really need to dip into the extra deck. Now, a new card that I know I've spoken ill of in the past, but that's because I completely misread it, Triple Tactics Thrust. So if your opponent activated a monster effect during this turn, the entirety of the turn, you can set a normal spell or trap from your deck to the field, and it cannot be activated the turn that it is set. But if your opponent currently controls a monster, you can add that card to your hand instead. This card has so much application in this deck. This gives us the flexibility to completely blind second, but also go first if we're ever forced to on a lost die roll. It lets us only play two copies of both Evenly Matched and Dark Ruler No More, but still conditionally have four functional copies of either of those cards. It also lets us tech in a one of that I've always said not to main, but we'll get to that later on. Going first, this can grab a Streaming Town if we get hit and an awkward time with a monster effect but still have additional birds in hand, or going into an established board, aside from the obvious of grabbing Dark Ruin or more or evenly matched, it can also grab us Pot Cards, Terraforming, Feather Duster, just so many options, even something as basic as Infinite Impermanence if we need to. This card really just adds so much flexibility to this deck. Overall, I'm happy with two of them, and bonus it plays under Droll as well, since you can just set it to the field instead of adding the target to the hand. Alrighty, now for our blind second suite of cards, we are on double Dark Ruler No More. Again, Thrust allows us to drop this down to two and still conditionally have four. It is a little bit of a trade-off as we do kind of need to eat a negation or have our opponent activate a card effect to turn Thrust into a third copy of this card, but two copies of Dark Ruler No More has been working perfectly fine, especially in combination with everything else that we have going on in the deck. We're also on one copy of Harpy's Feather Duster. This is less for the back row dedicated decks, although it is obviously very good against them, and more for generic back rows such as Infinite Impermanence that pretty much all decks tend to run, or forcing decks like Branded, Math Mech, and even other Philanderese decks to use their responsive back row way earlier than they would like to. And into the traps, we're on triple copies of Infinite Impermanence, just overall a very strong card. I originally put it in for the Kostura matchup, but it's really just been doing wonders on its own in every matchup. Again, something important for this deck, we don't necessarily need to stop a full board, we just need to lower the ceiling of what our opponent's trying to do so that we can start to chip away at it, and that's something that Infinite Impermanence is just amazing at doing. Plus, it's a flexible card for going first or second, or even just holding onto it if we don't necessarily need it because we have a Dark Ruler in hand so that we can just use it on our opponent's turn. It's been great, and I'm definitely keeping it in the deck, regardless of if Kashtura is in the meta or not. Following that, we're on two copies of Evenly Matched. Obviously, we're a go second deck, we need to be running this. Not really a ton to say about this that hasn't already been said. We are down from three copies to two in the main deck, as again, like with Dark Ruin or more, Triple Tactic Thrust allows us to be conditionally running four copies of this while only physically having two. Next up, one copy of Dreaming Town. Dreaming Town has a placeholder effect that doesn't actually do anything, but on the resolution of that effect, you can immediately normal summon a level 4 lower winged beast from your hand. While it is in the graveyard, if you tribute summon a monster, you can banish it from the graveyard to Book of Moon all monsters on your opponent's side of the field. Bonus as well, you are easily able to recover it with Tukan at this point. I've spoken a lot about this card in other videos, but being able to normal summon on our opponent's turn is absolutely incredible. Book of Mooning everything on the Tribute Summon of a Monster is basically game winning at times, and I still think one of these is perfectly fine. It's very searchable, more so now with Triple Tactics Thrust, and it's very easy to loop. The summon portion of the effect is a non once per turn, but we are limited in the amount of activations we have off of our small birds since they are all hard once per turns, and the Book of Moon portion of the effect is also a hard once per turn as well. And now, and longtime subscribers, feel free to be on my case about this one, but we are maining a card that I've always been adamant about just keeping to the side deck. We're playing one copy of Harpy's Featherstorm in the main. Featherstorm can be activated if you control a Wind Winged Beast and for the rest of the turn negate all activated effects from your opponent's monsters. Period. 
This doesn't matter where they were at the time of activation. If it's a monster effect that is activated, it is negated. Since I've been playing the Go second list, I've always been a proponent of purely keeping this card in the side deck as going second. Its usefulness is really entirely contingent on if you have a very solid opening, and this card unfortunately doesn't facilitate breaking through an established board. So why am I now maining one of them? Well, let's talk it out. I feel that Flunderies, if built to go first specifically with multiples of this card, is absurdly strong if it goes first. This deck suffers really hard from a lost die roll unless it is optimized to go second, and Featherstorm loses a lot of utility when you do go second unless you've broken through your opponent's board. But at three copies in the main deck, it feels like too much of a chance of drawing into something that isn't necessarily going to help you get through. However, Thrust gives us so much flexibility that we can afford to play this as a one of. Generally, either we go first, and if we get hit with a monster effect and have a wind winged beast on the field, we can go into this to buy one more turn, although this is entirely dependent on us getting stopped in our plays at the point where we do have a wind winged beast on field and having enough follow up to capitalize on our opponent basically losing a turn. Although, if this is the case, Dreaming Town is probably the better option. More ideally, if we get to play through the monster effects, we can use Thrust to search out Featherstorm in order to lock out our opponent's next turn while we still have a board to sit on. I wouldn't main more than one of these though, especially with Thrust, again, turning this into a conditional 3 of. I know I've always been against maining this, but I think Thrust in the deck makes it work as a 1 of, even if 9 out of 10 times we are going second game 1. So that's it for the main deck, let's look at the extra deck. Again, we don't use this particularly often, so it's really mostly just one-off tools for weird scenarios. Also, with Mind Hacker now banned, we have even less to worry about in regards of losing the neat one-of cards that we are rocking in here. So, getting right into it, we are on the same three Lyrilisks that I have been on for a while, Assembled Nightingale, Promenade Thrush, and Recital Starling. In order, Assembled Nightingale gets in directly to make a very easy double Azaeus line, Promenade Thrush is a desperate back row spin that can turn into a double Azaeus if we need her to as well. Plus, this is very situational. She has an attack boost to detach and boost a monster by 300. It actually has come up before to get a Ryza over a Geomathmech Final Sigma. And lastly, Restital Starling is a hilarious win condition that has only come up once where she causes both players to take battle damage from battles involving her. She also has a search effect to detach and grab a level 1 winged beast from the deck, but generally if you are making Restital Starling, you are not really going to need the search, but it is very good to know. And closing out the Xyz monsters, we have got a copy of Downward Magician and a copy of Double Azaeus. More or less, this is a last resort play. We do this by using map to enable us to summon two small birds without actually using any of their effects, going into Nightingale, then overlaying into Downard for an additional material, and then finally making Double Azaeus. Next up are Link 1s, Relinquished Anima, partly for the Dark Element, partly for punishing bad monster placement by our opponents, and Salamangrate Almirage, purely for the Fire Element. Following that, we have our Charmer package of Fire, Wind, and Dark. So I have Fire in here over Water, mostly for just being able to grab a used Ash Blossom from our opponent, and Almirage enables us to summon her pretty easily. Wind is also easy to make natively in this deck, and has a decent set of targets, mostly Kashtari Unicorn and Sword Soul Taya. Dark has absolutely no shortage of targets, and just requires us to make Relinquished Anima first before going into them. Following them, two more Link 2s, Nightmare Phoenix for desperate plays of outing there can be only one or other troublesome floodgates and then really just kind of hoping for the best afterwards, and Codebreaker Virus Swordsman. He is mainly here because he can out a Baguska. Next up, we've got Selene, Queen of the Master Magician. She is here for one reason, and that is turning a spent or in-hand dimension shifter and herself into our next extra deck card. And that is Access Code Talker. So I'm still on him. It comes up once in a blue moon that you just have to spit out a 5300 beater with a very nice destruction effect. And making him, we end up minimum going through two link elements, so you'll have at least two pops there. Funny enough, he can actually self banish as cost to blow something up, which has absolutely come up before for outing a skill drain. And lastly, we're on one copy of Underworld Goddess of the Closed World. She is purely in here as an out to Towers monsters that we would not otherwise be able to deal with out of the main deck. She's an absolute legend. 
So that is it for the extra deck. Let's go ahead and look at the side. So this will probably see changes way sooner than the main deck, but I'm just sharing what I've been playing for the past few days. Honestly, I change my side deck fairly often depending on where I'm playing and what's trending at the moment, but just consider this a very good starting point. So we're on triple copies of Droll and Lockbird. I have this in the side as it does conflict with Dimension Shifter, and a lot of the matchups that Droll is solid in, Dimension Shifter also works pretty well with a few exceptions. But we can side this in for matchups where Dimension Shifter isn't particularly great or to really double down on stopping power. This may change depending on how the format shapes up, but I've been liking it so far. Next up, we're on two copies of Danko Seca. I absolutely love this card, and it basically reads, you've more or less won the game if you are playing against Labyrinth. So I actually do think Labyrinth is positioned to be a really good deck going forward, and unless they shotgun all of their back row prior to the start of your main phase, Danko basically shuts off anything that they can do. Plus, she can attack over their main normal summon. We can also use map to follow up and go off to support Danko Seca afterwards. We just can't use Dreaming Town, but at that point, if you're siding in Danko for a specific matchup, you probably don't need the Dreaming Town. Next up, one additional copy each of Dark Ruin or more and Evenly Matched. This is really just to triple down on either of these depending on the matchup, or if we know 100% that we are going second, just to completely overload on the blind second staples. Following that, two copies of Cosmic Cyclone. We're actually down from three that I was previously playing, as we do kind of have a ton of back row hate already, between Harpy's Feather Duster, Evenly Matched, and Danko Seca herself. So this is more for sniping out problematic floodgate traps that our opponent might side into in games two and three. After that, we're on two copies of Enemy Controller. I absolutely love this card. I was maining it for a long time, and I really just wanted to find a place for it in the deck but I'm not sure how much longer I'm gonna keep it on the side as I don't side into it overly often. It does have some really, really good matchups, so I wanna try it out for a little bit longer, but it is probably my least used card in the side deck, unfortunately. Going into the traps, we're on two additional copies of Featherstorm for when we know we are going first to up the odds of seeing it and completely locking out the game. And lastly, two copies of Solemn Judgment. Just an overall very strong card if we know we're going first or going into a game that I know is going to be grindier to shut off our opponent at any key point we may want to. So that is it for the deck. I'm much more confident on this list than I was when I posted my previous one, as this one has been working up to my standards, but I will be keeping my eyes on the format as it continues and shifting what needs to be shifted as it needs to be updated. But I think for the time being, this is very, very playable and definitely a great starting point. I think this is going to be a nice format for Fulanderies, and I'm excited to see how it goes. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to drop it a like and subscribe to the channel for even more. And I will catch you all later.